All right, so we're going to talk a lot about transcription, which is basically the first step if we want to express a gene. And hopefully we know by now that to express a gene, what we mean is to take the DNA, which is the storage form of the genetic information, we're going to have to synthesize a transient carrier of that genetic information called mRNA, and then the mRNA is going to go to the ribosome in the cytosol and carry the information for making proteins in terms of the order of amino acids to add or to polymerize. Okay? In order to make the mRNA, and really for that matter any kind of RNA, we're going to have to use an enzyme called RNA polymerase. All right? So some basics about RNA polymerase. All right, first of all, it's a protein enzyme. All right. RNA polymerase, at least in eukaryotic cells, we're concerned mostly with humans, which are eukaryotic cells. Our RNA polymerases are going to exist in the nucleus. All right. We're later going to have a comparison of the different types. There's actually, in humans, three types of RNA polymerases. In plants, there are five. Okay. We have RNA polymerases 1, 2, and 3, and plants have an additional 4 and 5. Okay. Now, RNA polymerase exists in the nucleus because that's where the DNA is. So if we want to transcribe the DNA into RNA, we're going to have to have these enzymes in the nucleus, all right, where the DNA is. Um, additionally, one of the RNA polymerases, i.e. RNA polymerase 1, is in a specialized part of the nucleus called the nucleolus, which is the site of most of the ribosomal RNA, rRNA. Okay? Also, um, for RNA polymerase to work, Additionally, for RNA polymerase to work, we have, have to have plenty of nucleoside triphosphates, or NTPs, which are the substrates for RNA polymerase, ATP, GTP, CTP, and UTP. All right. Now, we're not going to go over the function so much of this enzyme right now. We're going to do that in a little bit. But what you hopefully see is that this enzyme is going to function in a very similar way to DNA polymerase. It's going to have a mechanism to break the two DNA strands apart, and those are those strands that are in blue, and then you see this green strand being made and coming off. That's the RNA. Okay, and RNA polymerases make all the RNAs that we have in the cell, which include mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, and then other types such as microRNA, siRNA, and small nuclear RNA, and there are other types that we don't talk about as much also. Okay? All right, before we get into the heavy-duty mechanics of how RNA polymerase works, we need to have an understanding of how, it even be, how transcription even begins. So transcription is going to involve three main processes. Those are initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation is just how the RNA polymerase gets on the gene that we want to transcribe into the RNA. Okay? And it turns out that initiation is not just as simple as RNA polymerase attaching to the gene and, and going. It turns out that in general, particularly in eukaryotes, but even in prokaryotes, there's a large number of proteins that have to assemble and get the RNA polymerase on there just right. It's not a simple process. It's very complicated. And as you could imagine, in eukaryotes, it's astronomically more complicated. All right, so up here on the top box, this is for prokaryotes. We'll talk about that first. Down here is for eukaryotes. This, these yellow boxes over here on the far right, this is the start site for transcription, okay? In other words, what we're talking about is this is the, por the portion where ultimately the RNA polymerase is going to start transcribing the DNA into RNA, okay? Now, if you go to the left, so before the, before the yellow boxes, before where you actually start transcribing, these regions would be called upstream. Okay, they are upstream from the start site of transcription. And these upstream sequences are, tend to be very important for binding of what we call transcription factors. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about in a few minutes a transcription factor in prokaryotes called the sigma factor. Okay, the sigma factor is the main transcription factor that we have in prokaryotes. As eukaryotes, we have much more than that. But the sigma factor is going to be very important for initiation of RNA polymerase or transcription. So upstream from the RNA start site or the transcription start site, we have these regions that are in purple called minus 10 and minus 35 regions. Then we also have multiple spacers. And you'll notice that these spacers, while they're not exactly the same number of nucleotides each, they generally range only a small amount. So you have N6, that's six nucleotides, eight, seven, but they're all going to cluster around the same amount. And then you have some, usually it's 
usually called a minus 10 region. It's 10 bases upstream from the start site, and they generally are fairly similar in their sequence. We have another spacer. These are a lot larger of spacers, and but they still cluster around the same amount, usually from about 16 to 18 nucleotides. Then we have what's referred to as a minus 35 region, and although the, the order of the bases, their identity sort of changes a little bit, it usually does not vary a lot, okay? The homology in these, or at least the relative homology in these regions, the minus 35 and the minus 10s for different organisms, plays a huge role because it turns out that these regions right here allow different proteins to bind, okay? It turns out that there are certain proteins, i.e., in prokaryotes, the sigma factor that bind to these specific regions of the DNA. Okay, turns out that the sigma factor specifically binds to the minus 35 region and to the minus 10 region of the DNA. And that's very important because the sigma factor is ultimately what's going to allow the polymerase, the RNA polymerase, to bind. Okay, if these this minus 10 region and the minus 35 region were mutated significantly in any way, the sigma factor may not be able to bind and RNA polymerase activity would be killed because RNA polymerase couldn't bind. Okay, and we'll go into the sigma factor on the next slide. But it's gonna bind ultimately to this region right here, 30 minus 35, and then the minus 10. Okay, these spacers are just spacers. They're just regions of not necessarily any sequence homology, but they're just a, a physical nucleotide space between the two important purple regions. And we have other upstream elements right here that are important usually for binding of other types of transcription factors. Okay, not necessarily the sigma factor though. Okay, the point is, is when you want the RNA polymerase to bind, it has to have other prior transcription factors like the sigma factor to bind as well, okay? In eukaryotes, it's gonna be very similar, all right? We have the start site for transcription, again, in yellow, and we have various other regions, all right? And um, we have this region right here called the INR. That is a, another part of the promoter that's going to bind transcription factors, particularly this one's gonna bind what's called trans transcription factor 2D. And then we have this one called the TATA box. It's TATA because it's T-A-T-A -T -A and then two other A's around minus 30. And then we usually have other regulatory sequences. These regulatory sequences right here, including the TATA box and this INR, these are going to bind transcription factors also. But there are a lot more what we call general transcription factors in eukaryotes. And combined, those are gonna allow binding of RNA polymerase to the start site. So let's briefly go over how this works in prokaryotes because this is the simplest system that we have. Okay, RNA polymerase does not initially bind to the DNA. So here's the DNA at the top with no nothing bound yet. The first thing that has to happen is the sigma factor has to bind, okay? The sigma factor, the way it binds, is it binds, as we said, to both the minus 35 region and the minus 10 region of prokaryotic DNA, all right? And this one specifically is sigma 70. There are three main types of sigma factors. We'll go over those in a different video. Usually we talk about sigma 70, sigma 38, and sigma 32. The sigma 70 is for transcription of housekeeping genes. Sigma 32 is for, is for heat shock proteins, and sigma 38 is for whenever the cell is in starvation. Okay, so there, there's different sigma factors to allow transcription of different genes. This is for housekeeping genes, but in any case, it's gonna function the same way. It's gonna to bind to the promoter, the region before the actual start site of transcription. What's gonna happen is when the sigma factor binds to the, it binds to the, the promoter, it's gonna facilitate RNA polymerase binding. All right, so once the sigma factor binds, you can see that this, this RNA polymerase is then going to attach itself to the DNA, okay? And the, the DNA is gonna, is gonna move through a channel in the RNA polymerase. You can see right here, this is a hollowed out view of the RNA polymerase, and what you can see is the DNA sort of loops through it, and then it's gonna exit through a channel right here. So there's a DNA channel where it exits, and then an NTP channel where nucleotides enter. But in any case, we're gonna loop the DNA through that channel in the RNA polymerase, and then 
the RNA polymerase is going to open up the DNA, causing the formation of the transcription bubble. So the transcription bubble is where the two strands are pulled apart. And the way that the RNA polymerase does that is it sort of bends the DNA into about a 90 degree angle, which drastically weakens the hydrogen bonds and facilitates the strands coming apart. Okay. Now, once the transcription bubble forms, basically we can, we'll say that the transcription is initiated. Basically what's going to happen from there is once elongation starts, the sigma factor is going to dissociate. The sigma factor is only required to initiate transcription in prokaryotes. But once elongation starts, which is when you actually start making the, the RNA, the sigma factor dissociates and it's replaced by another protein called NUS-A. So NUS-A is going to bind to the to the RNA polymerase and you're going to get transcription. Okay, eventually transcription will be what is called terminated, which just means it stops, and there are different mechanisms by which that happens and we'll talk about those in a separate video. And then once you have transcription terminated, the NUS-A comes off and the RNA polymerase also dissociates from the DNA, releasing the RNA. All right, now in all reality, it's a lot more complicated than this, okay? But suffice it to say, this is basically what happens. What it's important to understand is you have to have the sigma factor binding to minus 35 region and minus 10 to allow the RNA polymerase to bind. Okay, and it's going to start transcribing at this area. And in eukaryotes, you have a similar thing, although you don't have sigma factors, you have things that function in the same way. They are general transcription factors. And they're going to bind in these three regions right here, which facilitates binding of RNA polymerase in much the same way. All right, so make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.